This is the new Cockwell's Hardy 50 DS, and it's designed to take the ruggedness, the toughness, the seagoing ability of the original Hardy 50, and combine that with the finesse and the luxury for which Cockwell's is justly famous. Now, we're lucky enough to have Dave Cockwell's himself on board this boat, and we're gonna take it from here in Paul, right across to the South Coast Boat Show in Ocean Village to see exactly what she can do. The helm station on the main deck here is really quite a distinctive place to be. It feels quite commercial in a lot of ways. We've got that inverted screen. There's plenty of space up here. We're actually on a raised section of this uh, main deck, almost like you're on a pedestal. We've got fantastic views all around here, not least courtesy of that inverted screen, of course, which starts a decent way forward of the helm station itself. Um, the seats are a delight. Huge bolsters here. Not entirely necessary, really, because if I perch myself up on those, my head's right up here and visibility is kind of limited. So it's much more comfortable down in the seated position here. We've got an adjustable wheel, of course, to keep you comfy. Throttles to the right hand next to the joystick. Uh, bound stern thrusters here on the left hand side. Uh, plus uh, our tab switch here. And a couple of 16 inch plotters there on the main section of the dash. Uh, the engine displays, they're down here. Usually you'd have those between uh, the MFDs, but uh, that's been shifted down. And to be honest, the MFDs do so much uh, these days, there's no need for that to be up there. Instead, we've got a kind of cool backlit Hardy logo there, which I actually quite like. And a massive, again, commercial style compass right up there on top of the dash. This boat is essentially designed for Volvo Penders. Uh, D11 725s. What we have here though is a pair of D13 800s. Now the 725s, that's uh, the largest power output for that 10.8 uh, litre block. The D13s, that adds about a tonne of weight. And also here we've got some serious hydraulic systems on board, so that adds another three quarters of a tonne. So it's quite a heavyweight boat, this particular test model. As we get her up to speed, you, you hear the revs rise, and then those uh, sound readings, they kind of settle down. We don't actually go beyond about 75, 76 decibels once they start spinning right up. There's a little bit of bow lift, nothing too substantial, and I can dial that out, as you can see, just there, with a little bit of action on those tabs. And we've got decent winds running here today, at about 15 knots getting up to around about 20. So we got a little bit of chop, nothing too substantial, certainly not for a boat like this, and it handles it quite beautifully. What's clear right from the start though, is that a semi-displacement hole like this, well, the greatest efficiency, of course, is to be had at relatively low speed. So if we ease her right down, we're doing 15 knots now, if we ease her right down to seven and a half knots. Well at that we're drinking just two and a half litres per nautical mile in total. We've got a 3,000 litre tank or rather two tanks, we've got a keel tank and a main tank totaling 3,000 litres. Uh, so with redundancy in the system of 20% we've still got a thousand nautical mile at mile range at uh, seven and a half knots. At 12 knots you're drinking 10 litres per nautical mile so a range of about 250 miles. So you're drinking a decent bit of fuel at that, but what's really interesting and quite classical Cockwells is, well, we could do 22 knots instead of 12 and you're still running at 10 litres per nautical mile, so your range doesn't actually decrease. And you can see that very plainly here on this uh, right-hand MFD. Uh, Cockwells has long been into its digital switching and it's good to see, it's very user-friendly, we've got a simple range readout right here that calculates your real-time range based on what you've got in the tank and the kind of speeds you're doing. Now, as I say, we've got a total of 3,000 litres here between those two tanks. What I particularly like is the fact that uh, automatically 
uh, when the main tank requires it, fuel is transferred from that kill tank into the main tank so it's usable. And that means that you keep as much weight low down as possible, which of course improves your sea keeping. Now let's get her just up towards the top end and see how she does there. Okay, we've got good winds running, they're lashing us on the beam here on the port beam at about 20 25 knots. And in fairness, there is a fair bit of water hitting the screen here, making its way up towards the flybridge. So it's not an entirely dry boat in that regard, but as a semi displacement boat with not much in the way of bow flare, you wouldn't expect it to be. What you do get instead is a very, very soft ride. And what water does make its way inboard, well you don't really know much about it, there's a very muted thunk on that good solid inverted screen and nothing more than that, it's very cossety, very safe and secure feeling this boat. Now we pushed her right through towards the top end here, let's just sort out those tabs and even her up a touch, that's better. And at the very top end, we're seeing around about 27, 27 and a half knots. And that's quite interesting with these D13s because the guys at Cockwell's reckon if you uh, spec the D11725s, well, you're likely to get the best part of 26 knots at least. And of course, you're saving a good bit in terms of weight. So the likelihood is that even though they quote 26 knots in the brochures, you probably hit much the same 27, 27 and a half knots anyway. In any case, comfortable though this is, this is not the only helm station, of course, on this boat. This boat comes with the option of a flybridge. It's a £100,000 option, but given that this is a £1.7 million boat, or around about £2 million including VAT, uh, it seems like false economy not to opt for the flybridge. It only accounts for about 5% extra in the purchase price, and pretty much every customer that Cockwells has for this boat it's going to be specking that flybridge. So let's head straight up top and check that out right now. Well, access to the flybridge is pretty simple. Relatively steep steps, but a good wide aperture, lots of grabbing points. And as at the lower helm, well, up here on the flybridge, the helm is pretty much in the center of the deck. I spoke to Dave about that because often you'll get one on the starboard side, one on the port side, so you've got all bases covered. And he says, that's just bad seamanship. You want it in the center of the deck, as close to the center of the deck as you can. So that's exactly what he's done with this boat. Now, again, as on the uh, lower deck, we've got a, uh, a co-pilot seat there. We've also got some nice companion seating around on the starboard side, so your mates can keep you company if you're on a long passage. And although we got, what, 12 inches instead of 16 inches, the basic layout of everything here is exactly the same. It's just as fully featured. <clears throat> now let's, uh, there we are, select the right station and get ourselves back up and underway. Well, the seas are getting up a little bit more, two to three feet, I would say, and plenty of wind. It's very, very easy just to sit yourself on these swells at low pace and surf in with tremendous comfort. And Dave said that this boat does a really good job of essentially flattening the seas, giving you an impression that the seas are much flatter than they actually are. And I have to agree with them, it's exactly the kind of sensation it delivers. It's also quite interesting that given the actual footprint of this boat, given the deck layout lower down, that the flybridge stops quite short. Now there's a couple of reasons for that. Firstly, Dave didn't want a full-size flybridge because it looks ugly. Secondly, he didn't want a full-size flybridge because it puts too much weight up top. And as I say, weight is an important part of the way this boat handles at sea. And thirdly, the fact that actually this helm is positioned a good, what, 10, 15 feet further aft means that you're actually closer to the center of pitch. So when you're operating in quite lively seas, this, compared to the lower helm, actually feels a bit more sedate, a bit more comfortable. Now, I appreciate that this is a proper grown-up boat, a proper Category A offshore boat for serious passage makers, serious cruising, but let's face it, when you're on a boat, you want to have a play sometimes, and it strikes me we haven't yet done that, so what we'll do is get her up to pace a little and swing her about a bit and see how she does. 
when you throw her into a turn or two. Now the seas are coming in on our port beam. There's a moderate but decent bit of hill, nice and secure. And it's actually more in the way of agility and responsiveness than you necessarily expect from a big heavyweight semi-displacement cruiser like this. We'll swing her back round to the starboard side as well. There's plenty of tightness in that turn. Decent retention of pace too, I have to say. You keep those throttles on. And if we chase our way into our own wake, which is pretty substantial, as I say, this is a nice big heavy boat, and we'll smash our way through those as well. Well, I say smash, actually, it's pretty, pretty soft. I have to say, you'd barely know you were going through them at all. A little bit of water ingress, a, bit, a few uh, uh, splashes, particularly when that wind is on the beam. But as I say, the ride is really soft. The ride is really easy. It's a big, capable boat, but it's certainly a novice friendly one too. Well, we've transferred control of the helm down to the main deck now, so we're free to move around and see what else this flybridge has to offer. And in spite of the fact that it's not a full-size flybridge, in spite of the fact it's relatively compact compared to the overall scale of the boat, it's pretty well specced, it's pretty well used. If I move around to the centre, we've got a uh, decent size of wet bar, little catches to keep these closed at sea of course, a little sink on the port side, electric griddle on the starboard side and a big fridge underneath. And I mentioned it while I was actually at the helm, we've also got this companion seat in to starboard. Big enough for three people I would say, relatively cosy, but certainly a very comfortable spot. Again, that wind deflector pushes the wind right up over your head. It's really comfy and a great place to keep the skipper company. We've got our life raft under here. And if I move aft, well, the back end is the chief recreational zone on this flybridge. We've got a proper size of wraparound C-shaped dinette with a teak table. This is a thoughtful touch. When you fold in those leaves, you've got little bits of edging so that your gear doesn't fall off the table when you're at sea. And this, I'd suggest, is big enough probably for six people to have a meal in comfort. They might look at this and say, well, <clears throat> it would be handy if you had a tender up here and a crane. Dave's not particularly keen on that idea because, of course, that elevates the weight. And as I say, weight is a critical element of the way this boat performs at sea. Um, and we do, in any case, have a 3.6 metre tender down below on that swim platform. But if you absolutely want it, then that can be done. Now let's make our way back down into the cockpit. Because as I say, this is called the 50DS. And like the 65DS, the DS stands for deck saloon. And the idea there is that the external aft cockpit and the internal saloon inhabit one continuous single level space. The doors do open up very wide. We won't do that right now to integrate these two spaces. We want to keep people comfortable in there while we're at sea. So in the meantime, let's have a look at the finer details here. Now, we've got a small bench unit on the port side, a little companionway there, and then a larger L-shaped unit over here to starboard. Now that's all moulded, so not that configurable, but there's plenty of volume inside for storage. In terms of accessing that storage, you've got to fight a little bit. There's a little pull there to release the catch to get the cushion out of the way so you can lift the hatch and there are no rams to assist you with that so it's not the most user-friendly bit of storage in the world but as I say volume is good and the table's a pretty nice piece of work too that's natural teak beautiful quality again we've got these little lips to keep things where they belong exposed cup holders lovely stainless steel work uh, but in the future, certainly Cockwells is looking to use more sustainable alternatives uh, than natural teak. And as you can see, this is artificial teak that we have here on the deck, and very nicely rigged it is too. Um, now, if we just move to the aft end, we'll see that we've got a full beam swim platform uh, with access to a swim ladder. There's the tender we talked about, and that's not inflatable. That's a probably a proper uh, rigid uh, tender, aluminium hold and we have hydraulic lifting equipment there to deploy that. As I say, hydraulics all over this boat, hydraulic bow thrusters as well. 
And if you don't fancy the storage under those benches, well, we got a really big section in here, a huge lazarette with a proper ladder to get down in there. This is an owner's boat, and he's very much young at heart, likes his kite surfing, his windsurfing, all kinds of water sports. So even though we've got the sea keeper sitting right here in the center of this compartment, there is masses of space for all kinds of kit like that. So while these seas are relatively flat, let's head forward to the bow and check out what's going on up there. Now there's big substantial steps to access these side decks and you'll notice that there's a step from the side deck up as well with a little deck drain in front of it and that of course it is a category a boat is to stop water washing all the way back and into that cockpit good common sense feature that and this is even more sensible now we've got a diesel filler here and we've got a diesel filler on the other side two diesel fillers one on either side for exactly the same tank so it makes it much easier when you come to the fuel pontoon whether you're starboard or port easy job no draping pipes across your boat to get the job done We've got lovely high guardrails here and plenty of breadth in the deck and that's great because we don't have a guardrail up here and we don't really need one. There's a little lip that's nicely moulded and coated on the underside here so you can just grab that as you make your way along. Really simple, really easy. And we have a side gate here on the starboard side. There's a matching one on the port side. It's set a little back from the skipper's side doors but that of course lowers the height of the deck so it's easier to get on and off from the pontoon make our way further forward and you'll see that this is not your classical recreational Sunseeker style bow this is a proper workman like bow so elevated mouldings here to generate the volume down below but no island sunbed cushions or anything of that kind three windows on either side to admit a bit of extra light down below uh, plenty more space on this wraparound deck as you move towards the bow and a hydraulic windlass obviously for heavy duty work plus a handy little hatch here to access your anchor chain and there's loads of volume in there and really good heavy duty steel work here too. Let's make my way aft out of that wind and into the relative shelter of the cockpit and open up these doors to see exactly how these two spaces actually integrate. Now we've got a full door on the port side and we've got a two panel section here on the starboard side that hinges round and both of those are held open by means of these rams which is quite an effective system and the aperture is really huge. The integration is very natural indeed. There is a slight discrepancy in deck levels if you get right down perhaps an inch or so but nothing major so they do feel like an integrated part of the same section. And when you're in here it's a very attractive place to be, very beamy, good headroom and it's arranged with a huge seating area, a dining area on the port side, big enough I would say for six or seven people, nice deep windows here, excellent views of the sky, the sea and the horizon, you don't feel at all hemmed in and opposite that is a long fore and aft cabinetry section with loads of storage inside plus some branded crockery all in its little holder so you can go to sea and not smash everything up. Now this boat is called Mackerel Sky which is why they've made these plates with little mackerel on them but of course you can have whatever relates to you or the name of your boat, that's a nice touch. And on top here we have a TV that lifts out of the cabinet. Now there's no localised switch for that so you have to actually operate that as many other things on this boat with digital switching up at the helm. Below the deck here is of course the engines. Now as I say they're D13 so they're big, much bigger than the D11 so they really do fill the space but there's still room for all your hydraulics gear on the starboard side plus your generator, your calorifier on the port side and the filters are very usefully positioned at the aft end of that compartment so there's easy access to those for basic servicing and if you need to do a more major job on these engines then a larger section of this deck, much larger than that hatch, can be lifted out and apparently that's a much simpler job than it might look. Now moving forward <coughs> you'll see the deck height lifts onto the galley section and this is exactly the point where we're starting to generate that extra volume down below for the two cabins amidships. 
We'll see that in a second. But first, let's take a look at this galley because I'm really quite impressed with it. It's a kind of wraparound galley. It orbits you as you stand in here. And if I stand next to it, I'm a six footer, you'll see that the uh, work surface comes just up to hip height. It's a good few centimetres higher than you would tend to expect and that's a much more natural sort of position for me as a six footer to operate without stooping, without bending my back at sea and causing myself any pain. Again, there's loads of storage inside here, uh, plus a four ring electric hob, no gas on this boat for safety reasons. Um, high level storage, actually we've got the uh, uh, extractor fan located up there, but there is an additional bit of storage on either side of that. Some nice steel trivets built into the worktop. And Dave at the helm, very usefully, because I was about to forget this, I was so impressed by this earlier. There's a little corner storage unit that lifts like a magic trick out of that work surface. That is great use of space. Well done, Dave. Now let's move slightly further forward, past the full height fridge freezer, which is inside this cabinet to starboard, and see if we can shift Dave out of the helm seat so we can just squeeze past him. Because while we were helming, I forgot to mention a couple of other things that are really quite workmanlike. I'm quite impressed by them. So, as I mentioned earlier, we've got the skipper side doors. We've got a door to port, we've got a door to starboard. Um, nice deep side decks, side gates, easy access to rails and cleats. That's really, really practical. Uh, we've also got windscreen wipers in each section, plus a uh, compass that looks like it's been stolen from HMS Ark Royal. Absolutely massive, proper piece of kit that. And here on the port side, this will be really gratifying for traditionalists. We lift this hatch, that rarest of things on a modern boat, it's an actual chart table. Imagine that, fantastic. So let's pop down below and see what the impact of all these raised deck levels does to the accommodation. Now there's a stairwell that curves around 90 degrees on the starboard side. But as we go down there, well again, there's some clever use of space here. It's a really good thinking. This looks like a relatively shallow cabinet, but actually there's a full-size washer dryer in there. And this is even sharper thinking. Directly above that, we've got a dehumidifier built in. Exactly where you'd want it. And of course, it means if you're leaving your boat for long spells, you don't have to get a big bulky standalone dehumidifier in to keep things dry. Now, in terms of the basic configuration down here, Dave would ideally have this as a two cabin boat with a full beam uh, cabin amidships and an additional cabin up in the V of the bow. But the owner here uh, wanted three cabins for his kids. So he's got two cabins amidships and the owner's cabin in the bow. So let's pop forward and check that out straight away, given that that's the cabin that won't greatly change from one configuration to the next. And what we have in here is quite interesting. Now, if you had a planing vessel of this kind of length, you'd expect greater breadth up here. But here, being a semi-displacement boat, we've got a pretty substantial bow taper. You see the uh, hull sides coming up here and limiting your room. So it's handy that the bed has been elevated. We've still got a little space underneath for some storage. And there's a decent, if not massive, size of bed. Certainly big enough for two. You don't feel shortchanged by it. Um, and there's plenty of headroom too. Certainly good enough to sit up in bed and have a read by these reading lights. Extra bits of storage down both sides. And the woods are really quite attractive too. A mix of uh, woods and fabrics all over here. Looks pretty cool. The windows aren't massive by modern standards. Uh, as you can see, we've just got a couple of small windows on either side that look out onto those side decks, plus a hatch up above. But it's perfectly bright on a day like today. And we also have a little dressing table, I think, here on the starboard side, with a swing out bench tries to make the very most of the space. But well, we won't swing that out because we want to pop in here. And on a lot of boats, of course, this would be your ensuite. And it is to a degree. But instead of putting the toilet and the shower in one compartment, we got the toilet on this side, the shower on the other side, split one on either side. And I really like that. I really like that because if you're going cruising, you want that extra flexibility. If somebody's using the shower and you want to use the toilet, it can be a little bit awkward. So this is a great workaround for that. And when we head in, well, what that generates is a really tremendous space for your toilet compartment, I have to say. Absolutely cavernous, given the job it's required to do. Again, very well appointed 
very well put together. Everything feels very heavyweight indeed. And through this window, this third window on the starboard side, you do just see above the gunnels, there's a little view of the horizon, which makes a difference to the way you can feel when you're at sea. And let's pop across to the port side and we'll check out that shower room. As we do so, it's worth noticing this, a nice curved bulkhead, so there's no edge, no right angle to catch your elbow as you move through. And in here, well, given that it's a dedicated compartment, does everything it needs to do. Not massive headroom, if you're more than six foot two, I'd say you're going to struggle a little bit, but again, decent natural light, a view of the horizon, and a little shelf for your soaps and so on. Very decent indeed. Now let's make our way out of there and we'll head further aft and check out the guest cabins. I call them guest cabins, but of course, as I say, if this were one continuous cabin, this would absolutely be the owners, because it would be a vast space. Now we'll start on the port side, because this is the larger of the two. We basically have a, uh, a single bed that's convertible to a double on the starboard side, and here we have a permanent double, permanently rigged. Loads of space at the entry point in terms of headroom, before the deck head drops down, but it doesn't drop down too much. In terms of scale, this is the same sort of size of bed, in fact, as you get up in the bow. And again, we've got some decent cabinetry here on the port side, and I think a little dresser here that enables you, yeah, simply to sit on the bed, and it's rigged at the right sort of angle that you can see yourself and sort yourself out in the morning. So it's not a massive cabin, but given that we've squeezed two into this aft section, it's not bad at all. I think we've got some decent hanging storage in there. Yes, we have. And let's just squeeze past you again, round to the starboard side, the smaller of the two cabins, and take a look at this. I've got a bit of a soft spot for this. Uh, generally, I enjoy quite small spaces, quite tight spaces when I go to sleep anyway. Um, but this is quite attractive. As you can see, it's rigged as a single bed, but very easily you can just lift this up and pull it out and create a small double just like that. And because the integrated backrest expands the bed to double size, you don't have to mess around with additional infills. That's a very nice touch. Now, and imagine that you're supposed to sleep with your head aft, and that's perfectly comfortable. Uh, but for me, the natural trim of the boat suggests that maybe it'd be more comfortable putting your head forward. Either way, there's a little bedside unit and some heating controls and chargers. And because we have hull windows back here, instead of coach house roof windows, this arguably is the best place to come if you want to go to sleep and also have decent views of the horizon. But we're arriving at Ocean Village Marina now, and I have to say that although Cockwell's acquired the assets for Hardy back in 2020, this new Hardy 50DS is exactly what I imagined it would be. It's not so much about the recreational versatility or the flexibility of application, it's more about those simple seagoing practicalities. So if you're a cruising couple in need of a proper offshore passage maker, you're going to love this boat. If you're looking for something smaller and lighter footed, perhaps to use on Europe's inland waterways as well as at sea, then stay tuned because Cockwells is also working on a new Hardy 45 and that is going to be launched this September at the Southampton Boat Show.